our presentation. Uh, I think we're waiting still for a few more attendees to come in, but if you miss any part of this, don't worry because it's also being video recorded and you can check it out later. So with that, let me start. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Lindsay Hurt. I'm a marine biologist from New England, and I am part of National Biodiversity Teach-In today to present a webinar to you on humpback whales. Um, if you are a group and you have access to your text box at the bottom left hand of your screen, please let me know that you're here and that you can hear me. And also that you can see these slides. The first slide up is just a picture of a humpback whale with the words humpback whales on it. So just let me know that you can see things and I'll get ready to move forward. And as we do that, I'll just give you a little bit about myself. If you haven't seen me before, this is actually my third time presenting uh, my fourth presentation with National Biodiversity Teaching. Um, and I have done all of my presentations on some facet of whales before. I work as an educator and also as an advocate for the welfare of animals and also for the protection of our environment as a whole, but particularly focusing on marine work. That work spans across classrooms and boats and coastlines and laboratories and sometimes even government offices as I bring the story of the whales to the eye of the public. On commercial whale watch boats, I get a first-hand look at whales in their natural environment and I observe how they fit into the delicate balance of the ocean, which is why I'm here today to talk a little bit about biodiversity and how they, they um, fit into that balance. Because of their massive size and their really gentle reputation, whales overall are really easy to use as a vesicle, a vessel of conservation um, to deliver that message and just to appreciate them as having an important role in the environment. So I only have an hour here, and I recognize that most of you have a lot less than that. So to keep us all on track, here's a quick outline of what I plan to discuss today. You'll see the area where I'm broadcasting from. Uh, learn a little bit about humpback whale life history uh, and how they fit into biodiversity. Then I'm going to point out some cool features of their anatomy, and we can learn a bit about how to identify them. Some of that's going to be a repeat of a little bit of the information I've given in the past. Um, we're going to wrap up by discussing ways that you can take action to help whales, as well as uh, be a part of the positive change when it comes to biodiversity. And I am definitely going to be asking for your input along the way. Um, of course, if you have any questions, uh, you can fire them away at me during the presentation. There will be an opportunity for Q&A at the end. And you can also hit me up on social media afterwards. I will give you that information. So with that, let me move us to the next slide. Y'all can still see, right? Just making sure. Um, this is Cape Cod, Massachusetts. Actually, the, the map I'm giving to you is a basic map, of course, of the United States of America. And I am broadcasting to you from a little town called Plymouth, and that is in the state of Massachusetts, where you can see the blue arrow here on the right side of the map. Um, that little blue arrow points out to a really important place for biodiversity. Um, this is an area where the Pilgrims landed in 1620, and if you've had any information about uh, history in classrooms in the past, anywhere in the United States, you've probably heard of it before. The Pilgrims landed here in 1620, and of course they did that uh, partially by chance, but another big reason why they came here was because of the really rich natural resources that were provided to them in the area to allow them to survive. Um, and one of those resources was whales which are our aquatic marine mammals who are air-breathing and live-birthing and warm-blooded. And as you can see, it's a really rich opportunity to explore the ocean because Cape Cod itself, um, just south uh, and east to Plymouth, is really surrounded by water on three sides. So, since we're here uh, in such a great area to observe whales, because there is so much ocean all around us, on Cape Cod and in the Plymouth area, we are lucky enough to see whales of all kinds during different seasons. Usually we see them from boats and on the water, but sometimes we can even see them from land. 
on beaches and in harbors because we are such a salty backyard. I wanted to point out a couple of things. You may have heard the term cetacean before. That is in reference to anything that is whale, dolphin, or porpoise. Cetus is a Latin word that derives, uh, that the word whale derives from cetus, which is a Latin word. Um, it's also heard of in Greek language as ketos, which translates to huge fish. And basically what this is is a, a really widely distributed and diverse clade of carnivorous, finned creatures that are aquatic marine mammals. That means they spend their whole lives in the ocean, um, and they display the five characteristics of marine mammals. I'm sure you know what those are if you've spent any time in life science class. Um, does anybody know the characteristics of mammals? If you do, feel free to type them into your text box, and I want to see what you come up with. Five major characteristics with all mammals. Live birth, of course, is one of them. Good job. What else do you see in all mammals, whether they live on land or sea? Of course, they breathe air. They all have lungs, just like humans. Whales have extra gigantic lungs, and we're going to see a bit about how they accomplish that task to breathe a little bit later. Warm-blooded, absolutely. And they nurse with milk. It's an amazing thought that a humpback whale, when it's born, is about the size of a minivan. So they really require quite the grocery bill. It's a lot of milk to produce. What else? There's one last piece, and you're going to be really surprised by this one if you aren't very familiar with whales. If you can't think of it, I'm going to point it out now. You're not going to see it in this picture, and that is that whales have hair. It's very tough to imagine a shaggy, wet animal in the ocean, and it doesn't really work very well for them to be swimming all over the place with lots of wet, matted hair, but they actually have hair. Some only have it in the womb before they're born. And we do see that a lot of them lose their hair at birth or prior. Although there are some whales, like the humpback whale, that actually have some hair on their chin, chin, chin. And that does serve a purpose to them, like whiskers. We're going to talk a bit more about that later. Uh, but overall, the diversity of whales, dolphins, and porpoises in general is that there are about 88 species. Not all scientists can agree on exactly how many. Um, their habitat is circumglobal, which means that they exist all over uh, the world in all different oceans, but there are specific populations that live in certain waters. Here, the humpback whale population lives in the North Atlantic Ocean. We call them the Gulf of Maine population because they come to these waters for a certain part of the year. The body characteristics of them, we will point out a bit more about that later, but Overall, they have a tapered body that makes them look a lot like an airplane, so they can glide through the water. Uh, they have no external hind limbs except for a tail, which you'll see a lot more of that soon. Um, and their tail ends in a horizontal blade, that is, it goes this way instead of this way, like a fish. Um, and the, the blade on the end of their tail has two lobes to it. It looks kind of like this. Those are called flukes, and we're going to address those again later. In this picture that you see, I wanted to point out all the photos uh, in this presentation are mine from different whale watch trips that I have taken, uh, except for one that is labeled, we'll see later. And I wanted to start with this kind of picture here because there's a 110 foot long boat in the background here. And the whales that you see, you can only see a portion of their backs, just like the tip of the iceberg, and they are headed straight for my much smaller boat uh, out in Cape Cod Bay. Let's take a closer look at humpback whales in general. Now again, as we move along into the presentation, I will reveal more features of the humpback whale and what they actually look like. But these first views are to show you how you might observe them from a boat. It's, like I said, a bit like looking at the tip of the iceberg. Because they exist in the water, they're kind of a mystery to us. The only reason why we ever see them in the first place is because they have to breathe air because they're mammals. So here is a look at uh, three, perhaps four, hard to say, humpback whales in the water. Um, and I'll give you a bit more about their characteristics. 
Overall, humpback whales can be anywhere in the range from 30 to 56 feet long uh, in their body length. And it varies really where, what stage of life they're at and what oceans they live in. The average humpback whales in our waters here are about 45 feet long. They are about 25 to 45 tons in weight. And remember that a ton is 2,000 pounds. So we're talking about a pretty hefty beast here. Uh, they have a small hump and a, a dorsal fin on their back. I'll see if I can circle a couple here. They look real small. But I'm going to show you some bigger ones, if you can see those on my slide. And that's the characteristic for which they were named, the hump that's just in front of their dorsal fin. We'll get a closer look at those. And the other thing that I wanted to show you is these green glowing portions in the water here. I'm going to circle a couple so you can see. You see how they look very green? These are actually limbs. These are the pectoral fins or flippers on the whale, and they glow green underneath the water because the water here in New England is so full of life, it's so full of plankton, that it actually turns the very white color of the fins of our whales to more of a pretty green glow. <laughs> and we're going to talk more about that a bit too. Humpbacks, of course, are known as a very cosmopolitan species. As I said, they exist in all oceans in the world. Um, they, we recognize them for their acrobatics and their grace, and their apparently very friendly nature towards seagoing vessels, which allows us to whale watch them quite easily. Um, it really makes them a prime target for whale watchers and whale lovers like me. Counting them is difficult, but there is an organization out there who's sort of a watchdog on whale watching. They're called the International Whaling Commission, and they put the latest worldwide estimates on humpback whales at about 150,000. About 11,600 of those are North Atlantic humpback whales. And the ones that come specifically to Cape Cod, they're about 850. So when you really pare down the population like that, it's actually not very many whales. And before humpback whale protective laws were passed, their numbers may have just been in the very few hundreds. The last thing I want to point out on this slide is the scientific name for humpback whale, and that is Megaptera novangliae. Is anybody out there studying Latin? Because I would love for you to break down what these words mean. Let's try to break it up. The first word refers to the genus, and that is Mega terra. What does mega mean, everybody? You should know what mega means. When something's mega, it's absolutely what? It's huge, right? It's big. Terra refers to a certain body part on the animal. Has anyone ever heard of a pterodactyl? What do pterodactyl dinosaurs have that other animals don't? They have wings. So Megaterra directly translates to big-winged animal. The Novanglia part you can break down as Nova. Does anyone know what Nova means? And the other half of that is Angliae. Anyone heard of the Anglican Church, which is from what country? Nova Angliae. It means New England. So Megaterra, Novae Angliae, Megaptera Novangliae translates as the big winged New Englander. And that is because our very precious and beloved humpback whales return to these waters each and every year in New England. And they've got really big wings or flippers. So I'm going to tell you a bit more about that. As we look at this next slide, here is another map of half of the United States. I'm looking at the eastern seaboard side, all of the states that glow in green there. And we are in this upper area in Massachusetts in the Gulf of Maine. I'm circling right now where our whales end up. Uh, the general life pattern for all of the baleen whales, including the humpback whales, is that they like to breed in the warmer waters, like the Caribbean Sea, 
where there's not much food for them and they can concentrate on finding their lady friends. Now, if you move up to the cooler waters of the north, up here in Massachusetts and Maine, then those are the areas where there's a lot more food present. And so that makes it a really great feeding area. So what the whales do is, depending on the season, in the warm summer months, they are up here in Massachusetts. And at the end of the summer, as we get towards winter, they follow their own migratory path. They actually hug the coastline, and they go all the way down the side of the Atlantic Ocean, way down here to the Caribbean Sea. And that's a great place for them to go. They don't have a single drop of food while they're down there, so they really have to tank up before they do that. So what kind of activity do you think that I see my whales up here in New England waters doing in the summer? What would they be doing? Are they breeding or are they feeding where all the food is? They're breeding and giving birth in the warm equatorial waters. And in the north, they're going to be feeding. So that's, that's what they're up to. Most species carry out very long migrations each year between the breeding and the feeding areas. Because the seasons are opposite in the northern and southern hemispheres, whales in the two halves of the world generally don't mix. Uh, for humpbacks, that means they enjoy the cool waters of the north for their feeding, where all the plentiful fish is. That's here in the nice green waters of New England. And they head south past Florida to the warmer Caribbean waters to do their mating and breeding activity. Now, as you look at this map and the really squiggly lines that I've drawn, I'd just like you to see the relationship of the land to the sea and how the whales are associated with it. And that leads to a really important question, and that is, who has the right of way, people or whales? So just be thinking about that as we move forward. When there are a lot of whales very close to shore, and humans are very busy thinking about um, the kind of transport that we do and the number of vessels in the water, it leads to sometimes very negative interactions between the two. So I want to point out one of my very closest whale friends. Her name is Owl. Um, she is a survivor of an unfortunate event known as a vessel strike, or basically being hit by a boat. Um, and you can see these scars on her back from this event, which she thankfully survived from. Um, Owl was born in 1986. We followed her every single year since then. She was born to a female named Falco, um, and unfortunately hit a vessel, or a vessel hit her. Uh, where she suffered an injury. We recognize her because of her tail. If you look in the upper inset photo, you can see this big black dot on either side of her tail or her fluke. You see those there? And there are two big dots that they look a lot like owl eyes, and that's where she got her name, Owl. Um, so she was struck by a boat about 20 years ago, and you can see those uh, healed scars across their back. Um, unfortunately, this happened to her, but she was still able to survive, even bringing back a calf to Cape Cod as recently as 2014. Now, not everybody is lucky, and I wanted to sort of start our first half of the webinar really thinking about how whales are impacted by humans. Um, and there are a lot of threats out there, including the vessel strikes or the unsafe interaction with boats. I've spent a lot of time on this in my past working uh, with whales, and I really wonder what we can do to make things better so that whales can survive more easily and humans can also interact in a more safe manner. Can anybody think of other threats to whales besides being hit by boats? Write them down if you have them. I want you to think about the kind of things that we do in the water that might make an interaction with a whale or affect a whale in a certain way. One thing that comes to mind for me is the act of fishing. When there's a lot of lengthy and heavy fishing gear fixed in the water, that's something that whales can get entangled in. So things like marine debris, floating fishing gear, um, and trash, pollution and plastic I'm seeing, yes, those are big concerns for whales because they do a lot of eating and playing around in the water, and that can affect them if they ingest plastic or if they get tangled in any of this. It's really not easy for you or I to move around and go about our business if we are entangled in a mess of trash or 
fishing gear as well. So those are some of the things. I'm seeing noise as a, a factor potentially for uh, whale dangers, and that's an absolute truth. Whales have very sensitive ears. We don't actually see that, um, but if you really get looking very close uh, on a whale, they do have a very intricate ear system, and they are uh, very dependent on being able to hear things around them, including communication with one another. So whales are at the top of the food chain. They've got a really important role overall uh, in the health of the marine environment. And unfortunately, their large size and important role don't protect them very well. Um, they do have a lot of these threats like the noise and the entanglement and the vessel strikes and the pollution. Um, so many of the large whales are actually classified as vulnerable or endangered species, even after decades of protection. And that includes many populations of our humpbacks. So I ask you as classes to please think about what kind of human impact to biodiversity does that have? What are humans doing to our system that is causing a bit of an imbalance in our biodiversity? Be thinking about that as a classroom, and not just for my webinar, but for all of the webinars overall. Well, for me, I think of the fact that we use the ocean for a lot of business. I've listed a few facts here. I don't know how well you can see them through my whale pictures, but half of all Americans live in coastal watersheds. That means nine out of every 10 of the largest cities are coastal. So a lot of people live right around the borders of the United States. And that's actually true for all countries in the entire world. I'm only thinking about the United States at this moment. Um, we know that the ocean is used for a lot. We use it for food. We use it for transport. We use it to develop medications. We use it for energy resources, military testing, all sorts of different things every single day. In fact, ocean-dependent businesses in the United States alone employ about 3 million people, including myself, and do about $282 billion worth of business. So just be thinking about that as we, we move along. And in relation to the ocean and its business, why are humpback whales a natural resource? Why do you think they're important to biodiversity? I ask you this because I'd like for you to point out, try to draw out one impact that they may create on the whales. And you might want to do this for any type of animal or any facet of the environment. And that will tell you a lot about biodiversity. How does our action impact just one particular type of animal? I do have a great question from Kenyon. In the earlier sessions, we learned that whales are getting pregnant, but not necessarily having successful births due to a variety of human impacts. Are humpback whales suffering from the same issues? And that does tie in here, absolutely. It's also a factor in biodiversity. If a lot of whales are trying to give birth and it takes them a long time to do that and they need certain resources, it's hard for that to happen and they can't grow their population. Eventually, if these populations die out, it does affect the balance of the ecosystem. And I'm gonna show you a little bit about how. I've listed a few particular reasons why I think that humpback whales are an important natural resource the world over. Uh, I've mentioned a few already. They're important to our ecotourism economy and other facets of business. Um, there are people out there willing to pay tickets to sea whales, and that's about a $2 billion a year industry. Um, they're a sentinel species for ocean health. We think about them a lot and use them sort of as our, our image of how healthy the ocean is. And when they start to get depleted or affected in any way, um, then that really is a sort of a red flag. It's a reminder for us to be thinking about making the ocean very healthy. They're also a historical symbol for us here in New England and the rest of the eastern seaboard because we're a coastal community. On Cape Cod and in Plymouth area in particular, this used to be uh, an area of very heavy whaling or hunting for whales, including our humpbacks. And although it's not, they're not used in that manner anymore, 
not for their food or their oil. They're important to us now in a different way for the whale watching community. And then the final thing I wanted to mention, um, the reason why humpback whales are an important natural resource is because they really affect our ecological balance. That's tying back into biodiversity. Humpback whales um, have had a lot of research done on them in how they play a role in the environment. And one of them is through the whale pump. Uh, and this is sort of a new concept that we're just starting to see how important whales are to us. It's basically the idea that whales, as they swim through the water column and go up and down um, within the depths of the water, they are distributing nutrients as they consume and excrete, that's pooping, for those of you that don't know that word, very massive volumes. That's a humpback whale. If it weighs 45 tons, it might eat one full ton of food a day. That's about 2,000 pounds of fish or more that they're consuming. Well, they use some of that energy, but they also recreate it and allow the nutrients to be used in other manners once they poop it out. And that helps us to recycle our nutrients within the water. And as they move through the water, they're distributing those nutrients through all of the different water layers. And that helps us to um, get the nutrients to be used by other organisms, plant or animal. The whale fall is the concept that whales provide space and protection and nutrition to other animals once they die and even fall to the bottom of the ocean. I'm seeing a question here from EHS that, um, does ecotourism harm the whales? We learned earlier that ecotourism interferes with dolphins. And yes, that is another major impact that we as humans have on whales. Um, I don't want to say that whale watching or dolphin watching is bad for us, but we do need to do it in a really responsible way. So I'll talk a little bit about that here. Humpback whales, as well as all of the other types of whales, dolphins, and porpoises out there, do have a good amount of protection, at least in the United States, this is out there, do have a good amount of protection, at least in the United States. We have worked very hard for significant um, improvement in warning management and in risk management to reduce the impact of threats on whales. And they include things like educational programs and campaign efforts that help whale watching companies to operate their boats more safely around whales because sometimes they can get a little too close and that can be a little bit invasive and sometimes even perhaps a potential to to interact with a whale in an unsafe manner like hitting them with the boat and that is why we need to be responsible when we're operating our vessels and uh, we have very many successful programs here in the united states for that including a program called whale sense um, there are mandatory laws in effect, like the ship strike rule. There are seasonal management areas that we, we know that the whales spend a lot of time in. And when we know that the whales are seasonally in those areas, we try to take more care in our monitoring efforts and in slowing down our boats to allow them to pass safely through. Um, there are uh, many maritime awareness technologies like the AIS, VHF radio systems, and acoustic monitoring listening for whales, that is. Um, I've talked about that in the past with my right whale research videos. Um, there is an entire network of listening devices across our oceans to hear for the sounds of whales as they communicate with each other. And that helps us to better understand where they're located. There are reporting procedures and really rigorous scientific study, including the monitoring that whale watchers like myself do um, to understand their occurrence and behaviors. And there's some really cool technology like Whale Alert. That's an app I've also talked about before. You can easily get it for free to learn about how uh, whales act in your neighborhood. So all of these different protections are really helping whales by re-examining our current measures that we have for them and augmenting the scientific understanding that we have for them to really get in on their secrets and also to perfect our detection technology so that we are really a step closer in maintaining biodiversity. Uh, I'm getting a question from Kenyon that says, are there any diseases humpback whales are immune to that easily spread? Well, I would love to talk a little bit about immunology here, but we have 
really, really little time for that. So what I would say is, yes, humpback whales and other whales can contract diseases. Uh, we don't have vaccines for that, uh, but those are being monitored. If you'd like to learn a little bit more about how that work is being done, I urge you to check in with me on social media and I can give you some really good resources for that and also tell you about some of the work that I've done to help uh, learn about some of the diseases that um, we see. I'm going to move on to the next slide now because I know i got to keep it moving. And I want to talk to you a bit about the anatomy of humpback whales. Um, and to do that, I have this really neat model that I just got. And it might be hard for you to see, but I'm going to try anyway. This is a model of a humpback whale. And it's pretty true to form in terms of how a humpback whale looks. So I'm going to use it to talk to you about these whales and, and uh, show you what you'd be looking at in the water if you saw a whale. Now, if you look at the picture that I've provided here that says uh, anatomy, humpback whale model, this is the face of a humpback whale that has its open mouth um, collecting fish to feed. And you're getting a really great view of baleen, which we're going to revisit later. Whales have baleen instead of teeth as a filtering mechanism to collect all the many millions of fish that they eat throughout their life. Um, so let's start with the whale model. I'm going to, can you all see this? There's my whale eyeball here. I want to point out a few things on this animal. You can see that it's generally darker on the top and a little bit lighter on the bottom. This upper portion of the animal, the, I'll say, top half, is called the dorsal area. And on that, you're going to see the mouth and rostrum, uh, the main body of the whale, their little tiny dorsal fin, and the top or dorsal portion of the tail. On the ventral or underneath part, the sort of the belly of the whale that's lighter, you're going to see the big lines here that almost look like pleats in a pants. These are called rorquals, or more simply, pleats that extend the upper jaw when the animal is taking on water when they're about to eat. Um, the belly or the abdomen. And this longer, thinner part back here is called the tail stalk, and then the ventral portion of the tail. These are all the parts of all whales in general. What I want to point out about the humpback whale is their really long pectoral flippers, which extend from the chest of the animal. In the humpback whale, these are up to a third of the body length, or about 15 feet long each in an adult animal. And that's a really cool fact because humpback whales are actually not the largest of all whales. The largest whale is actually a blue whale, but the humpback whales have the longest appendage in the entire animal kingdom in ratio to their body length. So basically, they have the hugest arms in the world. Humpback whales are very characteristic. They have a humped appearance when they dive. Uh, and a really great field marking to find them is this long pectoral flipper. In the North Atlantic waters, our humpback whales' pectoral flippers tend to be a stark white color, which glow green underneath the water. Um, other field markings that you'll see, uh, we're going to get a closer look at in the next slide. I wanted to do a few um, up close photos. And so here they are. If you look at the animals in this particular slide, you'll notice a couple of things. I showed you a couple of minutes ago the grooves in the throat. And the throat of this animal is absolutely huge. It takes up about a third of the body. These grooves, or pleats, or rorquals, as they're also known, expand like a balloon when the animal takes in water. And we're going to get a good view of that shortly. But for now, what I want you to focus on are these little teeny bumps here. Can you see them? They look like they're almost set up in a uniform way across the nose there. My model also has those bumps. And it kind of makes the whale look as if 
it has a whole bunch of uh, pickle face going on here. These are called tubercles or stove bolts. And friends, do you remember in the very beginning of my webinar, I mentioned that whales have hair? This is the point of hair. That's the hair follicle for these animals. And it helps them to feel around their environment, just like a, a cat whisker or a dog whisker or a seal whisker. And those are the hairs in the humpback whale. The tubercles also have a very practical application. They channel water through them to make the whale more fluid dynamic. So they're pretty neat to see. The next view I want you to see is the blowhole. That's this big baby right here. Now dolphins only have one blowhole, but our baleen whales, like the humpback whales, have two blowholes that are under a lot of muscular control. When they're open, the whales can breathe through them. And that's the only place they get their air. They don't breathe through their mouths. And when they close, when they go into the water, of course, they drown if they'd stay open. So they're watertight when they're closed. That means that whales are voluntary breathers. They actually have to think to breathe. And then the other part you see is this area right in front of the blowhole, that little ridge there. That's known as a splash guard. And basically, it just prevents the water from getting into the blowholes. Kenyon asks if the hair on the whales are thicker than a human hair, and that's absolutely true. They're basically like thick whiskers that run in an organized pattern on the top of the whale's uh, nose and along its, its head up here, and also along its chin. So good question. Now, the major way to identify a humpback whale besides the long white flippers is based on the fluke patterns. If you want to know who an individual whale is, you look to its tail or its fluke. I talked about these big giant lobes before. Every humpback whale and all whales have one. They have a tail. On each tail is a, a left and a right fluke. And each side is absolutely different. For the humpback whale in particular, these are unique markings and patterns that show up basically because of pigmentation. Every whale has a different look to them. They can be very white, very black or anything in between. And that interesting idea gives us the power of tracking for these animals. Uh, thankfully, every single humpback whale has a very distinct flavor or pattern to their tail, and that allows us to identify them individually. Another great way to identify them is based on their dorsal fin. I talked about that little fin on top of the body. There it is right there, a closer view. You can also find them through scars or markings, sort of like human beings. If you fall down off a bicycle and get a big scar across your face, you're going to be known for that. And also by a tattoo. You know, this is an interesting marking on your body that no one else has exactly like you do. So through photographs, we can identify this. Here's an example right here of a whale who had a portion of its tail actually cut off from an entanglement issue. Um, and we know this animal not only by its pattern, but also by that particular scar. And on this lower picture here, I don't know how well you can see it, folks. I know your screen is bigger than mine. But there's a big depression from some sort of injury that this animal received um, some time ago. It's healed, but the scar still remains. Now, based on the idea that you can match a humpback whale to its name by its pigmentation, I'd like you to take a look at all the whales that I have here. There are seven flukes. This is the underside of the humpback whale, or the ventral portion of the tail. Again, this is the top of the animal, this darker part here. And the whiter part, in this case, uh, the ventral portion, is the area where you're going to see a very particular pattern. So this is the area that you're looking at here on our fluke matching game here. And I want you all to check. See if you can match all of these animals. Are there more than one whale pictured here? Are there two? Are there three? So type in your text box how many whales you think are there. And then in a minute, I'm going to tell you. So as I said, humpback whales, each and every one has an individual and unique tail, just like a human being has a very unique thumbprint, right? 
Well, that's really cool. And we can't do it for every single whale that exists out there. But for regular visitors, like the big winged New Englanders that come to Cape Cod every summer, if we see them again and again, we can photograph them, put them in a database, and learn who's who in the whale world. And there's a really great way to tell that. There are special programs and a lot of eyeballs that study this. So has everyone guessed yet? I see a whole bunch of different answers. However, I think I've stumped you. None of them are correct. <laughs> Every whale that you see here that, um, that is in this picture, they've all been seen in the last year in New England. Um, and the color corresponds with who the whale is. Now, don't forget, no field is really an easy time to exactly get the best representation of the whale. And that depends on how fast your camera is or your reflexes or whether the whale does a perfect dive and bring up their perfect tail just so you can see. It depends on how high the waves are and what the weather is doing. And you'll notice that all of these whales have a slightly different positioning that makes it just so that you can't see the entire tail. So this is great practice to start to understand the concept of how to match a fluke or a tail. So good job for trying, everybody. If you want more humpback whales to fluke, to fluke match, I'll be happy to do that with you through social media. I literally have 100,000 photographs of whales. I spent a lot of time in the water. So this is also a great uh, time to point out that identifying whales shows us more than um, just an interest story. Their, uh, learning about their life history kind of lets us in to their secret lives. So I, I would be loath to forget some of my best colleagues out there. I want to point out some of the work done by Whale and Dolphin Conservation, uh, who is world renowned. Uh, they have uh, put together tons of family trees. And the one that's white on the left side belongs to them. This is a family tree of the whale reflection. And on the right is the family tree of our most famous humpback whale, um, SALT, by an organization known as the Center of Coastal Studies. And these guys have done a lot of work in tracking humpback whales. There's a lot of power in tracking. It gives us information like um, the long-term studies will tell us really critical information about humpback whale science and conservation. It, it, um, it gives us information to improve the understanding of whale biology, like how often do they have a calf? And what are some of their population threats? And what's their status? How many of them are there? Where do they hang out? It also really highlights what we can do to better protect them. So I always like to mention our most famous humpback whale. She's the best example of uh, the fluke matching ability. She was the first ever whale to ever be named. There's her picture right there, or her back end picture. In 1976, she was the very first humpback whale to be named. And since then, it's taken off, and we've named thousands and thousands of them. Um, so she's really the best example of the practice. She returns to Cape Cod every single year. And since she was named in 1976, she's given birth to 14 calves. One, including uh, her latest, was in 2016. And that little whale was named Sriracha. Two of her daughters gave birth. And you can see that is um, represented in this second column here. Um, to 14 calves between them. As of the year 2014, Salt's granddaughter, Etch-a-Sketch, had her own calf, which made Salt the first ever recorded great-grandmother. That's four generations in whale world. Um, she also gave birth to another calf in the year 2016. And we'd never have any of this information if we, if we didn't learn or, uh, or understand or work on tracking the whales themselves. It gives us really fantastic information, all these long-term studies. Now, humpback whales, like all cetaceans or other whales and dolphins, have really complex behavior. Uh, and they've been observed to cooperate with one another, to teach, to learn, to grieve, and even engage in some social play. They even participate in very complicated forms of reproductive behavior, like competing in groups for attention of the ladies down in their breeding waters of the Caribbean. Now, humpbacks, as I said, they have a reputation for gentleness and also singers. I think there was a mention of um, the noise 
uh, issue earlier today, humpbacks do a lot of listening. They have um, a very regular and intricate sequence of repeated sounds that they make, such as those made by crickets, uh, by birds, by frogs. They, all the humpbacks in one given area, or a population of humpbacks, they will sing the same song in one year, except with just a teeny individualized twist. While all songs are going to be the same in each individual year, no two years are at all alike. They change or evolve just a little bit every year. And this can be shown through the sound libraries that acousticians have recorded over time to learn more and more about the, the sounds that whales emit. So as one naturalist I know likes to put it, every year a new hit comes out in the whale world. So it's a good way to describe it. The singing that they do seems to be related to courtship. It's different than just making communication sound. It's actual song. Um, and so these whales don't generally sing in New England during their feeding time. They only tend to do it in their breeding areas down in the south. So I only look at that as perhaps it's impolite to sing with a mouthful of fish. But other scientists seem to think that it is directly related to courtship. And of course, I've got a list here. Um, that you can see of the other types of behaviors they do. This is not a complete list, but some of the um, behaviors include flipper slapping, nursing, of course, because they're mammals, tail lobbing, logging, and breaching. The next slide um, shows a really dynamic look at how humpback whales feed, and there are going to be two of them in a row. They are only going to play once because it's not a video, it's a GIF. So just be prepared that that's coming up now so like, you can get a better look. Here's a humpback whale doing a bubble net feed. If you look all around as it came out of the water, there were big bursts of bubbles all around it um, as it gulp fed using its baleen. Here's a better look at the baleen in the next slide. As the whale comes out of the water, it's lunging out of the water with um, a good amount of water in its mouth. I'm going to play that one more time so you can see it circles of bubbles all around. What these whales are doing is they're blowing bubbles to corral in fish and take a big, huge, efficient gulp. And there it is again. And you can see this is a really great view of the baleen hanging from the upper jaw of the whale. I like to mention that baleen because the suborder Mysticidae, here comes Latin again, actually means a mustached whale. And so we, we call the humpback whales and all of our other baleen whales mustached whales because they have this filtering mechanism that hangs from the upper jaw in curved rows. There's about 300 or more of these plates that hang down um, on either side of the jawline. And they can differ in number um, with the species. But basically what they are is they're tough, flexible plates that have fringes on the inside. And it's made from the same proteins as your fingernails and also as your hair. That's keratin. The inner plates of the baleen are, are sort of fuzzy. Um, and so when you think of what that looks like, it's hard to see unless you have an actual specimen. But think of a giant push broom where all of the dust and crumbs get caught. Um, and thinking back to the suborder Mysticidae, to which humpback whales belong, it can be translated as mustached whale. So it's basically a giant mustache on the inside of their upper jaw that helps them corral in and filter out all the fish and push out all the water. Here's another great behavior on humpback whales, and that is breaching. And I could go on and on about breaching for a million hours, but basically I'll, I'll say that the breach behavior, I'll uh, show you once again, is a giant propulsion of the whale flying out of the water and then smacking back down onto the surface of the water in the world's largest belly flop. And scientists aren't sure why exactly whales do that. Humpback whales are really well known for it, although other species do it as well. We see it a lot up here in the north. Um, we think that it might aid them in digestion or help them to get the food moving along as they smack themselves against the water. Uh, it could be because they're itchy and they're trying to remove some parasites. And by the force of the smack, that can help remove them. Uh, it may also be a form of communication with other whales because it's so, so noisy. It can be heard from absolutely miles around. And my personal thought is that these whales, if you really look at this gif again, 
I mean, honestly, it just looks like he's having a whole lot of fun. We see a lot of little baby whales doing that, or calves. It's a really fun thing. So I've given you an overview of some of the protections on these whales and why we watch them and, and how they are identified and the kind of really neat behaviors that they exhibit. A lot of people ask me after a whale watch or after talking about whales, how they do it. So I'm going to give that to you here. There are talking about whales, how they do it. So I'm going to give that to you here. There are literally millions of different actions that you can do um, in order to uh, protect whales. Uh, one of them overall is just to report when you see them, and especially if you see them when they're in trouble. So you can do that um, through um, US Coast Guard on the VH VHF radio. But if you don't live right next to the coastline and you're not actively watching whales, another way um, to help them is just to um, participate in advocacy groups, to learn more about them, to talk about them. Uh, there are many groups that I've mentioned um, in previous talks and also today groups like the Center for Coastal Studies and Whale and Dolphin Conservation, and even just really responsible whale watching companies who take part in special training to make sure that they operate their vessels safely around whales. Um, there are education programs. There are research studies. There is citizen science. Um, there's all kinds of things that you can do to help out. And it's not necessarily just to throw money at a certain organization, but also to literally volunteer for them or to support them, talk about them on social media, things like that. Another thing that you can do, I think it's really important, especially in this political climate, is to learn more about ocean health in general. And a great way to do that would be to find out more about the National Ocean Policy, which was an executive order established in 2010 that states that all federal agencies and the people within them must protect the ocean and coastal communities the Great Lakes ecosystems and understanding and supporting this kind of work, as in the National Ocean Policy, it means that we can enhance the sustainability and the cooperative management of all things ocean, including, of course, our whales. And the final thing I'll say about how you can help whales is to leave no trace. Take some social responsibility, stash your trash, and recycle anything that you can. That executive order is. Um, National Ocean Policy, for those of you asking at EHS. I've listed it here on my um, slide. And I think this is a really important one for people all over the world to know, as well as in the United States, because healthy oceans, uh, we depend on them whether we like to or not. They store a lot of our carbon dioxide. They provide us tons of food. They produce much more than half of all of the oxygen that we breathe. If we don't have healthy oceans, we're literally not breathing. So that's something to be thinking about. These are the actions you can take. And if you want to learn more about whales, you can certainly do that with me. I'd like to ask out there if there are any questions uh, for me about whales or anything ocean in particular, because um, we do have a few minutes remaining here. I know that there are some groups that are going to have to leave for their next class, and I understand. Uh, but if you have any questions for me, feel free to do that now. And here is my social media information. I am on at Ocean Devotion 84 on Twitter. Um, and you can always reach out to me through that bio teaching. Uh, I do want to send a quick shout out before we do end today to Captain John Boats in Plymouth, Massachusetts. Uh, I work as a senior naturalist for that company, and it allows me the opportunity to um, get on a microphone and share my experience with whale lovers like you. Uh, also, the company uh, Hyannis Whale Watchers in Barnstable, Massachusetts. I've done a lot of work for them in the past, and they have a beautiful boat and a great opportunity to be looking at whales. And the other I want to point out is an organization called Sea Salt Charters. They're a responsible whale watching organization in Provincetown, Massachusetts. And every single picture that I took today in these slides are, are from Sea Salt Charters trips from the last couple of summers, including the one that you see here with these enormous humpback whales right next to the boat. So a really cool organization that um, takes part in responsible whale watching practices. I will take your questions if you have any. If not, this would be the time that you can sign off and take down my Twitter if you want to ask me questions later.
I have a couple questions here. Some, some great ones from Kenyon. I'd love to address them both really briefly. How intelligent are humpback whales? And I'm going to expand that to how intelligent are whales. Uh, it is well known that humpback whales exhibit and um, take part in behaviors that are almost human-like. But I don't want to humanize them. Um, I want to tell you about how different they are from us in that they even engage in behaviors that we can't understand. They're excellent problem solvers. And they work together to do things like feed in an organized way, in groups. And that's really important for survival, but also for communication and social behavior. It is known by some neurobiologists who are working on humpback whale behavior and, um, and their brain function that they actually have an additional part in their brain that even we don't. So there may be some sense there that they can understand that we even don't know about. So I think they're really pretty smart. Now, the other question I'm getting is, how does global warming affect the whales' migration patterns? And that's a really great question, and it does affect them greatly. In this political climate, I worry about saying too much extremist uh, views on that, but I can say that as the temperature and acidity of the ocean change, uh, of the ocean, as the ocean changes, it does affect where the food that the whales eat is distributed. And this is zooplankton and some of the small bait fishes. Basically, um, when some of the, the temperatures change, it affects the ability of certain organisms to survive well in those areas. So they move to other areas, which means the whales then have to move to find their food. And we actually are seeing in, in very short periods of time, in a span of five to 10 years, that whales are changing their own habitat in order to find their food better because of changes in the temperature and acidity of the ocean. So definitely something to think about. Um, I'm having, I'm getting a question from Sandra. How far do whales migrate? And uh, that is variable. We have seen some, for example, in our North Atlantic population that just travel from Cape Cod area down to the Silver Bank in the Dominican Republic. Some of our whales slide even further north um, to more Canadian waters to do their feeding. And we've seen a few whales even do transatlantic crosses where they go from one side of, of our ocean over to European waters. So that can really vary from the hundreds to the thousands of miles. If anybody else has questions, I would love to take them later. I know I'm going to take up the whole day if I stay here much longer. So uh, let me just say thank you so much, friends, for viewing my webinar today on whales. As I'm sure you can tell, I can never stop talking about them. I also want to send a shout out to Deb, uh, who's done a great job organizing this from the start, um, to the Elgin School, uh, because you guys are incredible on everything that you have ever accomplished with this whole amazing project. And also to Yo Oceans, who I've been following them uh, with their curriculum, everything that they have done to expand uh, and, and expose students to the wonderful oceanic world, and also to my whales. So, Thanks, everybody. Uh, if you need me, you can find me on Twitter. I'll be posting all kinds of pictures next summer on the water. And um, I appreciate the opportunity. So have a great day, everyone. Please, please, please take part in more webinars, because this is really an epic endeavor. Have a great day. Bye-bye.